Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, you can see it. Thanks. Yeah. All right, fantastic. We'll get going then. So good morning, everyone. My name is Gavin Pikes, and this is my research proposal presentation. So my project is on Monte Carlo simulations in the modeling and optimization of Linux bunker shielding, and my supervisors are David and Pejman. So a brief overview for my talk. So first, I'll be going over the background of Monte Carlo simulations and their use in radiation shielding, the aims of my project, significance, my project plan, and the relevant publications. So the background of Monte Carlo simulations. So the Monte Carlo method uses random sampling to simulate events and interactions. So what this means is essentially, rather than trying to solve for multidimensional integral differential equations, which as the name suggests are quite complex, we are instead using random probability calculations to provide a numerical answer to a deterministic problem. So this is obviously ideally suited for radiation physics where we're dealing with stochastic motion of the particles. Monte Carlo simulations are also capable of tracking billions of particles at a time. So again, this makes it ideally suited for radiation physics. So rather than trying to analytically solve for energy depositions, for example, we can instead track the particles as they move through the simulation and deposit their energy. Monte Carlo simulations are also the quickest way of solving for complex radiation problems. So they're quicker than all other methods. However, that is not to say they're actually quick by any means. They're still very computationally intensive. So the relative error in Monte Carlo simulations is proportional to one on the square root of n, n being the number of particles being run. So this is shown by my little graph here. So what this means is if we want to reduce the relative error by a factor of 10, we need to run 100 times more particles, which obviously means the computational power adds up quite quickly. But within the last couple of decades, the computing power of computers has increased enough where this has become quite a relevant method for radiation shielding calculations especially as compared to, say, the 1940s when the Monte Carlo method was first proposed and it wasn't exactly viable with uh, any kind of computers they had back then. So there's also a number of different Monte Carlo codes available to produce the simulations. So just as you'd have Python, Java, C, etc., we also have a number of different Monte, Car Monte Carlo codes. So I'll be using Giant 4 and then the gate plugin within that. So Monte Carlo, in radiation shielding has become a preferable method, especially as compared to, say, the equations provided by the NCRP, the National Council on Radiation Protection. So the kind of more analytical techniques are not as useful for more complex bunker geometries. So you can see here I've got an image of the Mary bunker. So this has quite complex geometry, which means the simpler equations don't really provide particularly uh, relevant shielding calculations for this kind of geometry. So it also means we can individualize the shielding calculations much more to our specific bunker, so we're not quite as boxed into using a very generic kind of bunker design. Monte Carlo simulations are also the only way of determining depth dose curves within the walls themselves. So obviously we can't go and just insert an ionization chamber or such into the wall as that will uh, affect the energy deposition quite drastically. So Monte Carlo simulations are really useful for this. Additionally, we're able to simulate different effects of changing changes to shielding through Monte Carlo. And so say we wanted to change wall thickness rather than making a mock wall and using a Linux beam on that with an ionization chamber behind it to uh, examine changes. We can instead just simulate it through Monte Carlo to then uh, quite quickly and easily see how the changes to shielding are uh, produced and what effects they have. Obviously, Linux shielding is quite necessary to avoid exposure to the staff and public not receiving radiotherapy, as the radiation involved can be quite harmful to healthy tissue. We do want to try and restrict all that exposure to within the bunker itself and avoid exposure to the rooms outside of that. So Monte Carlo is quite relevant in quantifying where our radiation is being, uh, where our energy is being deposited. So the aims of my project. First aim is to produce an accurate Monte Carlo model of the Sir Charles Gardner Hospital Mary Linux head and the surrounding bunker. We then want to validate these simulated results with measured data and then move on to an optimization of Linux bunker shielding. So this involves cost reduction, space efficiency, and then just the general shielding capabilities of the bunker itself. But I'll speak about that a lot more in the publication section. So the significance of my project. So first of all, we're able to validate current Linux bunker shielding. So ensuring the bunker is actually working as intended and there isn't exposure to the surrounding rooms. 
However, if there are any weak areas, we can then look at methods for improving those. So say a secondary barrier is too thick, so one of the smaller walls uh, is too thin, sorry. We can then go and increase the thickness of that to reduce that exposure to the uh, next door room. We can also test different bunker designs with different energies. So say we had a six uh, bunker design, uh, bunker design for a six MV beam, we can then try an 18 MV beam to, to see how the shielding is working that if it's still adequate, as well as testing how different changes to within the bunk optimization are affected at different energies. And again, the shielding can be used to optimize uh, space and cost usage, as well as just the general shielding capabilities of the bunker. So my project plan is split into three different sections, Monte Carlo modeling, data validation, and optimization. So the first section is the Monte Carlo modeling, where we're producing a mesh model of the Mary bunker. We're then producing a model of the LUNAC head and then creating a phase space uh, to store the particles produced by that LUNAC head. So what we're doing is saving all the particles produced by the LUNAC head to one little phase space file such that they can then be reused in a simulation of the bunker without having to rerun those results. So it just really cuts down the computational time required. We also may need to implement a number of variance reduction techniques. So these work to increase the computational efficiency of the simulations. So in uh, with the radiation in play, we have a lot of particles that won't necessarily be going to any areas of interest or regions of interest. So rather than wasting computational power on those particles, we're instead trying to allocate as much computational power as possible to the particles actually going to the regions of interest and providing the useful data. Moving on to data validation, there's three main methods we'll be looking at. So the first is comparing the depth dose in a water phantom between our simulated and measured results. We then looking at the 10th value layer in our primary barrier from our Monte Carlo simulation and documented values. And then finally comparing the energy deposition within and outside the bunker between our Monte Carlo simulation and radiation survey results. In terms of optimization, there's four main areas we'll be looking at changes to wall thickness, different bunker materials, so primarily in regards to the concrete of the bunker being used, and then looking at modifying the maze geometry and the addition of novel improvements, which again, I'll speak about more in the publication section. So I've already made some progress on the first two sections, the Monte Carlo modeling and the data validation. So in terms of the Monte Carlo modeling, you can see on the left here, I produce an image of the Linux head I'm simulating. So this has been modified from one of the uh, neck head models included in gate, but with a couple extra features added to make it as realistic to the real scenario as possible. So you can see the bright yellow bit uh, just in the middle of the neck head there is our 6 MV flattening filter to really try and make that beam as realistic as possible. And we've also got our jaws given in the smaller green and yellow boxes. So those are working to collimate our beam down to a 40 by 40 centimetre uh, field at ISO centre. And then you can hopefully see there's this white square just behind the jaws as well. So that's our face space plane. So what that's doing is creating is absorbing all the particles from the Linux head and saving them to a phase space file. So again, we don't need to rerun those particles in the actual simulation. You can also see that uh, phase space plane is significantly gap bigger than the gap in the jaws would be. So that really helps in still catching all the leakage particles from the jaws. So again, trying to work is to get as realistic of a beam model as possible. In the right hand side image, we can see there's a mesh model of the bunker we've created. So in yellow are the walls of the bunker, in gray are the roof and floor. Red is an air box I've created within the bunker, and then in blue is the water phantom that we're taking depth dose measurements in, as well as there's a little white line in the center there, which is our phase based plane. So again, the plane producing all our radiation particles. In terms of data validation, I've made a little bit of progress on this already. So on the left of this um, screen here, you can see we've got a depth dose curve for the water box. So this is percentage depth dose against depth. So the orange line is the simulated results from the Monte Carlo simulations. Blue is the measured results and green is the difference between the two. So you can see after this first initial peak, we've got quite a good match up between the data. So we get a root mean squared value of 1.08% if we don't include this 
first initial uh, difference from the peaks, or the first big peak difference, sorry. So yeah, 1.80%, it's quite a good matchup in the data, so quite happy with that at the moment. We've then taken a depth dose curve within the primary barrier for an 18 MV beam. So you can see that depth dose plotted against depth in the center graph here. So the dotted plot is our depth dose curve with the purple line being 10% of the maximum normalized dose. So you can see these lines intersect at about 44 centimeters, which is 97.8% of our documented 10th value layer of 50 centimeters. So the 10th value layer is just the depth at which we drop from uh, we dropped to 10% of the maximum maximum energy deposition or dose rather. And on the right hand side, we have a figure of the energy deposition within the bunker room and walls. So you can see here, this is on a log plot. So on the scale to the right here, that's the power to which the energy deposition is given. So obviously the light areas here are many orders of magnitude more intense in energy deposition than the darker areas. So you can also see there is not much in the way of any leakage of the photons outside of the main room. So we don't have much in the way of photons actually passing through the walls, as well as there is not a lot of radiation getting to the end of the maze. So this does make val uh, validating against radiation survey results taken outside the bunker a bit tricky, as our relative error is quite here, quite high here. But you can see we've got a nice set of reasonably um, reasonably accurate results actually within the bunker room itself. So we'll likely need to take some measurements of the energy deposition there and then compare our data to that to reduce the relative error problems outside the bunker. In terms of publications, I split this into three main sections. So Monte Carlo modeling, data validation and optimization. So in terms of Monte Carlo modeling, there's been a couple of different papers that have made similar kind of Monte Carlo models of Linux bunkers to me. Very few have used, uh, well not very few, but most papers are using different codes to me, of course, as there is such a wide variety. Obviously, gate isn't the most ideally suited to dealing with neutrons and also isn't the most user-friendly of codes. So once we start dealing with the photoneutron production around 10 MB, which a lot of papers uh, recently have been dealing with, uh, other codes do start to uh, be slightly more well-suited towards that. Uh, in terms of histories, so the number of particles being used, most papers are using between 10 to the 8 and 10 to the 10 histories. So this gets us a really good relative error within the bunker itself. But again, we start having issues once we go outside the bunker and our relative error starts increasing with just the lack of particles actually getting through, or photons actually getting through the walls. In terms of validation, most uh, Monte Carlo models are being validated against uh, most Monte Carlo models are being validated against energy deposition measurements taken within the bunker. So a number of different survey measures have been used, but the important bit is the number of measurements that have been taken. So most people are using between about 16 and 40 on average. So this allows for quite a good comparison between the measured results and the simulated results. In terms of optimization publications, this is the more interesting bit, I think. So there's been four main areas here, as I mentioned previously, wall thickness, wall materials, major design and nozzle improvements. So Rushkin especially has put a lot of effort into examining wall thicknesses in regards to the recommendations made by the NCRP. So in one paper examining 75 different uh, bunkers that have been built, he found that a 43% cost reduction could be made just by removing the overly conservative values used uh, to determine shielding. So over shielding has been quite prevalent using the equations from the NCRP. So with the bunker around the size of the Marylinac bunker, this equates to about a $340,000 AUD saving. So obviously quite a noticeable saving there and quite an easy uh, source of optimization. As well as that, he's found that a lot of these equations have resulted in a full value of a uh, full tent value layer of over shielding at the primary barrier. So again, that can quite easily be reduced without, while still maintaining an adequate radiation shielding capability. In terms of war materials, a lot of different materials have been tested, but there's been a big focus in high density concretes recently. So these have been found to be 
quite useful in reducing the scattered particle fluence variation with angle. However, especially above 10 MV, you get problems with the photoneutron production. So these higher density concretes are involving high Z material, high Z materials within them, then resulting in the higher dose of the patient actually from the raw material being used. So obviously it's an ideal for high energy beams. In terms of maze design, one of the big findings has been that triple bend mazes have shown to be superior at reducing the dose at the entrance of the maze. The Mary Bunker does have a triple bend within its maze. However, the first bend is not a 90 degree angle, so there could be some room for optimization there. Additionally, we can look at the width of the maze corridor. So uh, um, a higher width corridor actually reduces the dose at the entrance as well. So that can be something to examine. In terms of novel improvements, quite a few have been made, but some of the more interesting ones are these three. So Elephant looked at layering the walls of the maze with lead, which actually resulted in a 35 to 80 percent decrease in dose at the entrance. However, again, this is with a lower energy beam, as once we start going above that 10 MV threshold, we do start dealing with the photoneutron problems with high Z materials, especially. Uh, steel layering has also been applied and found similar results. And then the other interesting one has been nanoparticle doped concrete, which has resulted in a 1% decrease in uh, 1 viable decrease in primary barrier width, as well as a 20, up to a 25% decrease in the maze door width while still maintaining the same shielding capabilities. So I think that's all I really have to say. So thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Great. Brilliant, Gavin. Nice presentation. So any questions from Gavin? Ashid. Yes, um, Gavin, that was wonderful. Um, thank you. Um, a question I have, um, have you compared to our survey results for Mary? Uh, yes, I'm still in the process of doing that at the moment. And where is your scoring um, playing for comparison? Uh, sorry, would you mind rephrasing the question? Um, so when you're comparing to the survey, um, where are you counting your particles? Um, at what distance from the walls? Where is your scoring uh, so, plane? Yeah, so the survey is just given uh, the locations of each of the points. So I think considering the most of those points taken are outside of the bunker with Bond being at the maze entrance, I don't have the exact locations for them, but the variation in results like plus or minus say uh, 20 centimeters wouldn't make a massive difference. No, what so, I'm trying to say is not, um, maybe I'm not explaining it well. At what distance from the wall are you scoring? No, no matter where the location of each point is, you need to be at a specific distance from the wall because measurements have been done at particular distance from the wall. So where are you um, scoring right on the wall itself or like 10 centimeters, 15 centimeters, where, where is your scoring plane? Yeah, so I haven't I haven't set that in concrete at the moment, so I can obviously ah. move them around a bit. But a lot of the papers I've read, well, not a lot, but some of the papers I've read have been using uh, about 10 to 15 centimeters away from the wall. So mm. I've got a couple um, measurement boxes set up there. Yeah. OK, yes. thank you. Uh, good work. Yes. This is Monir from uh, Medical Physics. Uh, I like your uh, your hypothesis about these projects. And soon in uh, maybe June, July, we're gonna install new banker in Mary. So come over and talk to us, and we'll introduce you to the commissioning team, and maybe you'll be able to attend the radiation survey we can perform there. And we usually yeah, use yeah. the document NCRP 151 for the radiation survey, so you can read it and look at it, and then it will tell you exactly at what distance we do our measurements. Uh, yes, that's all. And maybe we already have like a, a report for uh, the radiation shielding for Mary. So feel free to compare to this uh, radiation shielding if you want to compare your data as well to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah that would be perfect. Yeah, 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 come over when you come to the department and uh, I will introduce you to the team who are working on it. Yeah. 
Hi, Gavin. Okay, so Godfrey. Hi, Gavin. Th thanks very much for your for your for your nice presentation. I was just wondering. You mentioned about, um, I mean, with the with Monte Carlo, you can actually get PDDs in uh, concrete and all that. I was wondering where they're going to generate that. Uh, sorry, could you repeat that last bit? Uh, I'm saying you you uh, you mentioned that um, we can't measure dose in the in the concrete, but with Monte Carlo, you can predict. So I was just saying that uh, in your in your study, in your simulation, are you going to do some PDDs in concrete and the like for interest sake? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I think on one of my slides, I'll just share my screen again. Uh, I saw something like that, but I, I don't know whether I could interpret that as something in concrete. Um, so yeah, this center graph. You mean that one? A, yeah, so this is from within the concrete of the primary value, uh, the primary um, wall. So is that what you're referring to? Yeah, that's what I'm referring to because I just wanted to see where it, um, unfortunately, it's a bit small for some of us. Anyway, I'll, I'll catch up with you. Uh, it, it, it'd be lovely to see that. That's good. And the, mi and the mixture of your kind of your concrete and all that, I just wanted to see how it uh, predict when it changes the energies and all that. Yeah, yeah otherwise, thanks yeah. very much for that. So uh, Gavin has got measurements PDD for water tank just at other center. You probably noticed the water tank was in the uh, beam and measured the PDD for water and also for the wall. Yeah. As you mentioned. Okay, so there's a question from Tom sure. um, okay. in the chat. If you could have a look. All right, I see the face base plane is modeled of the exit of the beam. Have you considered leakage through the head shielding? Um, yeah, I haven't looked at that explicitly yet. I don't think it'll be a bad idea to include it. However, I'm not sure how easy it'll be to do. I think James would probably have some information on in regards to that. But yeah, I think it would definitely be interesting to include. I don't think the um, yeah, I don't think it, the extra leakage would make much like a significant difference towards the end of the maze or like outside the room. But yeah, at least within the room, I think it would definitely be interesting to include. So I'd probably have to speak to James more about that. Yes, inside the room is important. And why not outside the room is not very significant, Gavin. But what is why you think outside the room, the leakage from the head is not really important? Uh, I'd have to assume it wouldn't be quite as high of an energy and it wouldn't be penetrating all the way through the wall. So that's we're dealing yeah, with that's that's how yeah, and there's a few okay. particles in a bit of getting through. So, yeah. Okay. So, any other questions from Gavin? Martin? Um, I guess the, when you're thinking about the design of a bunker, you, you, you've been looking at the physical factors that matter. Um, do you think there are other factors that matter, so uh, related to the treatments that it's used to deliver? Um, yeah, so obviously there there is an, a point of aesthetics and, you know, making the patients feel comfortable in the bunker. So we don't want to go start, you know, making it's it. It's not exactly what I was thinking of, that's a, but that's a good but point. That what <laughs> it's not exactly what I was thinking of, but uh, that is a good point. You don't want to have to put the patient in a tunnel. But, um, yeah, I, uh, I guess um, we also have years of accumulated treatment histories for these bunkers so we know where the beams have been pointing more regularly etc so that's also going to you know, impact on the bunker design is uh, if the beams are always pointing to the left for example then that obviously would impact on the the required thickness on the opposing wall um, so the, we, we call that the the use factor so how how much the, each wall is exposed at any one time um, but that, that's something we can look, you can look into. Yeah, yeah, that was definitely interesting. 
That's great. Thanks very much. Any other questions from Gavin? Uh, thanks very much, Gavin. And if you can please stop recording, that would be great.